There we go. It is on. It is on. Good to see all of you. Shenyun Kweiler. Ni hao. It's all I got. It's all I got. Happy New Year to you. I know that New Year's is celebrated over a couple weeks, but I had the privilege of joining our Chinese community on Friday. And if you know the term fish out of water, that was me. Um, I, uh, it was wonderful to be a part of their festivities, eat dumplings and, and eat some of the food that some of it, I wasn't sure what it was, but I ate it and I loved it and it was delicious, and they had performances and dancing, choreographed dances, and it was all held here at the church. It was, uh, had to be 100 people or so here. It was just wonderful, so I was excited to be a part of that and, um, and just honored to share in that um, tradition. Well, today we start our new series on the book of Hebrews, and we, are, we have many different ways for you to go deeper in this series. Um, in this series, we'll be going through the book of Hebrews. We also have a supplemental book um, called, uh, from A.W. Tozer called Experiencing the Presence of God, um, which you can buy here. We have a few copies. They're $22 each. Or you can find a free, I said free, PDF, online by just typing in to Google A.W. Tozer's Experiencing the Presence of God. Uh, we will also have questions that we'll release every Tuesday to help you in your devotional life to follow along. Our hope over the next few months is to go deeper through this book. Um, the book of Hebrews is rich with theology uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And so we're excited to, uh, to go through this book together. So I'm Joel, for those that don't know, I'm one of the pastors here at Northside, and I'm excited to share with you this morning. Thank you also for parking on the streets. I just took like a quick look outside and we're all up and down, lands down in the side streets. I appreciate your effort to making our parking lot safe. Let's pray. Well, Father, without you, this is just a performance. But with you and in your presence, this can be transformation. I pray that as we open your word and as we just hear the promises that are found in your word, we would be transformed. Whether we come this morning skeptical, curious, excited, discouraged, joyful, or sad, I pray that your word would speak to each one of us and minister to us, Lord, as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews is probably written around um, just before 70 A.D., the reason it's probably written before 70 AD is because in the year 70, the temple was destroyed, and there's many different um, messages throughout Hebrews that point to work in the temple, sacrifices in the temple. We don't know the author of Hebrews. Um, there's many different um, people that have been suggested. Some suggest that it's Paul. Some suggest that it was Apollos. Some suggest that it was Barnabas. Some suggest it was Priscilla, and I, I like that choice. I would choose Priscilla. She was a wonderful leader alongside Paul. What we do know is that whoever wrote the book of Hebrews was around Paul a lot because the book is rich with Pauline theology. The book of Hebrews is also a cross between the Old Testament and New Testament. There's many different messages throughout Hebrews that point us back to the Old Testament law, the way the priests offered sacrifices, and it also is very New Testament in that it is centered around Christ. So we would say that Hebrews is deeply Christological. 
which is a big word, but which means the study of Christ. Christology is the study of Christ. Hebrews is centered on the cross, on the personhood of Jesus Christ, on the work of Jesus Christ. The message today is how we enter into God's presence because of the work of the cross. In other words, we have no business being in God's presence. We are born sinful, we are born dark, we are born greedy and angry, and we are born liars, we are born as criminals, basically. We have no business being in God's presence. We have no right to be in God's presence. But that's not the end of the story. Through the work of Jesus Christ, we enter into God's presence. One amen for that. Wow. I will chip away at you. I encourage you through this message that you would be strangely aware of God's presence even here. For some of us, we might feel his presence. For some of us, we might just know that he is here. For some of us, we will hear a truth in this sermon that is so personal that you will leave here saying, God was here. For some of us, as I read the word, and I, there might be one word that jumps out to you where you say, God was there. It might be in an encounter with somebody who's sitting next to you, a, a smile on their face or a, a hug or a handshake where you say, God was in that place. My prayer through this series isn't simply to learn about God. It's that you would know him deeply Amen. and experience his presence, not just in your mind, but in your heart. My hope is that you would leave here transformed. And I'm expecting that to happen for some of you. Our main point this morning is through Jesus, we are invited to have a personal encounter with God each day, experiencing the presence of God. I wanna look at three points today. Um, number one is his presence in these last days. His presence in these last days. The second point is his presence requires righteousness. There's a legal requirement to be able to enter into his presence. And our third point is his presence brings justice and joy. First point, his presence in these last days. By the way, when I say that there's three points to this message, you know me, right? We might get to them. They're optional. We might get all the way through them. There might be a fourth point. There might be one point. The points I just read may not even be the points at all. But I love you, and I'm trying to just be a little more orderly, so thank you for humoring me. I love you too, thank you, Claudia. His presence in these last days. Hebrews chapter one, verse one to four. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name Remember that name? What a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name it is. His name is superior, and he has inherited a superior name to the angels in heaven. God is not simply an angelic being. God is not a force. God is not an energy. God is not just power. God is not a feeling. God is a person. And God is displayed in the personhood of Jesus Christ. 
He's displayed in the personhood of Jesus Christ. The greatest miracle ever is the incarnation of God in human form in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, when he was born in flesh, when he took on humanity, God was born in Jesus. Now it says here that in the past, God spoke through prophets, God spoke through leaders, God spoke through pastors, God spoke through individuals in the Old Testament. The way this would work was God would call somebody aside, one person. And he would call this one person aside and he would say, I've got something for you to tell my people. And so they would go into the prayer closet, they would go up a mountain, they would go into a cave, and God would speak to this one person. And then this one person would come before a bunch of people. I know you can't even imagine this, but one person speaking to a bunch of people about what God has said to them. This has been, we've been doing this for thousands of years. But in the past, God would only speak to one. And he would speak through one to many. Hebrews 1, though, talks about not just the past days. It talks about the last days. And it says in the last days, different from the past days, I'll speak through Jesus Christ and through Jesus onto the Holy Spirit and from the Holy Spirit on to you. The Bible says that in the last days, God says my spirit will be poured out upon mankind. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men and old men will dream dreams. Even on servants, both male and female, God will speak. In other words, what's happening here in Hebrews chapter one is God is saying through the writer, in the past days I spoke through one, but in the last days I'm gonna speak to all. The reason the last days are different from the past days are because of the Holy Spirit that is poured out upon us. My challenge for you today is, are you living like the past days? Or are you living in the last days? Our relationship with God is daily, moment by moment, personal. If you have a Sunday to Sunday relationship with God, you're living in the past days. He has something new for you in these last days. To speak to you, to speak through you. The world deserves an encounter with God. And that encounter happens through you and me. Have you ever been in a long distance relationship? I remember Sonia and I, when we first dated, we were dating in university. I was living in New York at the time and she was living in Canada. And so we were together during the university semesters, but in the summer we'd go home. She took the long trip from Langley to Port Moody. (laughs) And I took the long trip from Langley to New York. Now I'm gonna say something crazy that you probably haven't heard for a long time. And and I'm sorry, it's just so extreme, you're probably not even gonna believe it, but we actually used to write handwritten letters to each other. I know, I know. I know, it's actually the last handwritten letter Sonia wrote to me. 23 years ago, I carried it around in my Bible. It's on blue paper, and she shares her feelings. And I remember reading that, and just it just fed me. But distance is tough. We would talk on the phone. You know, we didn't have FaceTime then. I mean, you got it so easy. I say long distance and you're basically still together. No, when I say distance, I mean distance. I mean, we didn't see each other. We wrote, we emailed, we talked on the phone. And that was okay for a while. 
but I remember every time we would see each other again. Uh, we always left six inches for the Holy Spirit between us, but it was so good to be together. It was so good to embrace from six inches away. Are you kidding me? Of course, we hugged and kissed and, and towed that line that we all tow before we're married. It would have been strange for me to show up and see her and go, ah, just, hi. Hi, honey. I'm over here. Let's maintain that long distance relationship. That'd be weird, because that's not love. But some of us, we, we have this moment with Jesus. We pray a prayer, we raise our hand, we say, yes, God, I give you my life. And at some point, we just distance ourselves. Some of us, we maintain a long distance relationship with God. Might even write letters every once in a while. Might get convicted a couple times a year. Might even pray every once in a while. We might even crack the cover on this book. But being a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, is to, is to seek his presence as much as you possibly can because you are in love with him. My hope and prayer through this series, again, is not that we would learn more about God, but we would learn to know him, to move from past days to last days kind of relationship. You see, we are born restless. Augustine says that we are born restless until we find rest in God. I don't like being restless. Do you ever get restless? This morning I was restless. I woke up at 5 a.m. restless. Not particularly anxious, not particularly discouraged, not particularly weighed down with the burdens of life, but awake, awake and restless. But many times we wake up in the middle of the night and anxiety floods in at 2 or 3 a.m. I talk about this a lot. I'm very open about my 3 a.m.s. I wake up. I'm restless. I got a lot on my mind. I can't go back to sleep. I go down. I put the tea on. I read my Bible. I pray. And about two hours later, I go back to sleep once I can rest again. So for me, I, I'm restless and I can't go to sleep. Did you know that our souls are born restless? Unable to find rest in anything that the world has to offer, we search for it, we look for rest, we go on vacation, we go to Hawaii, we go on different things, we go to yoga, we go to Pilates if you're Christian, you know, we do these things. <laughs> Um, we, we try these things, we try to find rest, but we're restless. We're restless because we only find rest in him. In a society that is woke, they are restless. Awake to justice and all of these things, which... I'm not saying they're bad or evil. I'm not going to start talking about them right now. Some are good and some are just weird, but there's all this wokeness. Everybody's awake. Everybody's awake, running from thing to thing, but nobody has rest. We're created with a restlessness in our heart that has only found rest in, in God. You might find yourself here restless. Experiencing the presence of God is the way to find rest. And the cross is the password to unlock the presence of God.
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, how many people? Pretty clear, huh? No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is saying, I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. The reason that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life is because Jesus paid the price on the cross that we might have access into the presence of God. It is by the death of Jesus Christ and only by the death of Jesus Christ do we have access into the presence of God. Like the cross is the password that unlocks the presence. We all have passwords. We have passwords on our phone. I've, I've got a facial ID password on my phone right now. I've got a, a, a password on my watch. It's one, two, three, four, and you have to type it in. <laughs> Same as yours, yeah. Just make it one, two, three, four, everybody. Let's trust again. Let's take down these walls that we've put up. Way too many walls. You know, our computers now, it's like you could do the fingerprint on the new MacBooks. Fingerprint access. Unless you cut your finger and then your fingerprint doesn't work. Then you actually, I mean, this is crazy. This is so inconvenient. You actually have to type it in. You have to type in your password because the fingerprint doesn't work. As I'm preparing this message, Jesus said, listen, I'm the fingerprint. Jesus said, I'm it. I'm the facial ID. You want to get into God's presence? It's me. You want access into God's presence? You can have it as much as you want, except it comes through me. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This isn't religion, this is relationship. And there's only one access gate, there's one, only one password, there's only one way to get into God's presence. And it's available to all of you, but you have to go through the one gate. It's Jesus Christ. Now, you might think that that, come on, that's really exclusive, Joel. It has to be for more. No, it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross for you that, he, that was paid for that price. Like, only he paid the price. You see any other God crucified on a cross, died, put in the ground, resurrected? You see any other God doing that? No. The other gods are like, worship me. Our God is like, I will come and die for you. And by my blood... I provide you with access in. Who's it available for? All who believe. So Jesus says, I am the way, but all can come through. I am the truth, but it's me. I am the life, and I have life for all of you and life more abundantly. But Jesus says, it's through me. Just like no one else can unlock your phone. You can't get through a back door to get to God. Paul says in Colossians 1.15, he says the sun is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation He's the firstborn over all creation. He's also the firstborn of all recreation of which we are. He is the, the a visible, manifest, revealed depiction of who God is. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. He's the picture. For all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him. Everyone say through him. And for him. Everyone say for him. For him. All things have been created through him and for him. Are you looking for God's will for your life? Are you looking for God's purpose in your life? 
Are you looking for the meaning of life? I'll answer this. Put down your phones for a moment. Go back to the sports scores in a minute. I'm gonna give you the answer to the meaning of life. Your purpose is for him. You know why your purpose is for him? Because he created you. And the creator of anything always knows the purpose. But Joel, I don't know if I should teach or, or you know, be a garbage person. I don't know, do one of them, but your purpose is to worship him. I don't know if I should go into business or you know, have kids. I don't know, but your purpose is to worship him. The problem is, is when we're disconnected from worshiping him, we toil, we wrestle, we struggle, we don't have rest. We're looking for something to find meaning. We are not human doings. We are human beings. Ah. A human being is meant to be in the presence of God. And the more areas of my life where I'm aware of his presence, the more areas of my life that have purpose, meaning, understanding. Somebody once came to me, a young person, and they said, I, I don't know what to do, I've got three options. I'm trying to discern God's will for my life. I said, just, just pick one door and go through it. What if it's the wrong one? I don't know, come back out and go through the next door. That, that's pretty much my counseling technique. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, if you open that door and there's a lion there and it bites your head off, then it's probably not the right door. Um, see, God promises his presence. He says, I will go with thee wherever you go. It's when we're unaware of his presence that we struggle over the decisions of what to do and how to do this, that, and that. Because we've become human doings. We find meaning only in what we do not in who we are. But we were created through him and for him. Isn't that freeing? It is for me. It's so freeing for me. It's so freeing for me to not sit up here and have to do, but to just to be. It's quite freeing. You should try it. His presence requires righteousness. I will only get to this point and then we'll have communion together. A.W. Tozer says this on page 21 of the book that you're all going to buy after the service. He says, man's moral conscience, crying for pardon and cleansing before the presence of the great God, has now found it by an event, an act of the eternal son, who is the image of the invisible God. He turned aside to do this awful act. He single-handedly purged our sins. He alone could do it. So we did it alone. This awful act became a lawful act. This awful act of the cross whereby Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and his blood was shed. It really is an awful act when you think about it. It is a torture device that Jesus himself God, the God man, fully God, fully man, he did for all of us. It is an awful, awful act, but it was lawful. It was required. A sacrifice was required for our sins, for my sins, and for your sins. But there's something that happens on the cross that not only does he pay for our sins, but something else very important happens. And I want to read this to you. This is also very hopeful for you. 
2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul writes, God made him who had no sin. Who's that? Jesus. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Let's leave that verse up there for a moment. I want you to look at the divine exchange that happens here. The perfect, spotless God-man, perfectly pure, perfectly holy, majestic, unbelievable, anointed, everything, the one we worship, the, the Lion of Judah, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, the God that created the universe, hung on that cross, and he became your sin. He took on your sin. So that in him, by him, through him, you would become the righteousness of God. Maybe you're here today and you don't know God. You wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus, a Christian. Maybe you think that Christianity is filled with rules and regulations and I'm I'm just gonna lose all the fun in life if I become a Christian. Maybe you just need proof of God's existence. Maybe you're angry with God. Maybe you're just starting to hear about God and you're just curious. Wherever you're at this morning, hear this truth. Although you are sinful, full of greed, full of lust, broken, sick, you're a gossiper, addicted, and deserve life in prison, it's what we all deserve, there's another option. The other option is that you get right with God. (laughs) What I mean is, let's put that verse up one more time. What I mean is, is you get righteousness Righteousness means that God looks at you and you are made right. Inside of your spirit, when you come to know Jesus, your spirit is completely and totally pure and holy and righteous and blameless. He took on the worst parts of me on the cross. He became like me for a moment that I might become like him for eternity. We are tri-dimensional beings. We're born, we have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. Our spirit is completely regenerated, completely born again, completely holy, completely pure, and completely righteous when we come to know Jesus. Our soul will continue to be saved for our whole life. Our mind, our will, our emotions, we're never perfect there. And our body will be regenerated in the afterlife when we get to heaven. But he took on the worst parts of us that we might become like him for eternity. For those beating yourself up over a decision, a moment, a past relationship, a regret, something that you've done, you're beating yourself up over it and you're thinking about it even right now as I'm talking. I felt the Father say, I paid for that now. Now enter into my presence. He just washes you clean. He just sets you free. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You come to him with regret, He says, I wash you clean, now enter into my presence freely. My presence is for you. He takes great joy in watching his children come home. He takes great joy in watching his children set free. He takes great pleasure in watching his children healed, saved, and delivered. As a father, I take great joy in watching my kids love something that I bought for them. And I'm saddened when they don't. If you're a parent, you've had this moment on Christmas 
you buy them a gift. They love it in the moment, but a couple weeks later, they're just not playing with it anymore. I felt the Lord say, there's, there's some of you today that you, you received the gift of salvation with great joy, but somewhere along the way, you've drifted. And this morning, he simply wants to say, come into my presence. I wash you, I cleanse you, I set you free. You're always acceptable, son. You're always acceptable, daughter. And he paid for it. Our time of communion, I'd like to call the ushers forward and our worship team as well. Our time of communion is going to be a time of you and the Lord and him simply cleansing you and welcoming you back into his presence. Maybe you've been distant, but he is available through communion. Our ushers will be positioned throughout the sanctuary with the juice and the bread representing Jesus' body and Jesus' blood. You're welcome to participate, to receive his body and his, his blood for you. And in this, we remember what Jesus did for us. And so I'm gonna pray, and then the worship team will, will play softly, and then you can go to the different places and get the elements. We have gluten-free here at the front, if you need that. Father, thank you for this time of communion. We pause to reflect on the work on the cross for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.